Copy that, Houston. Sealed in isolation in a tiny capsule millions of kilometers from home, the first manned mission to Mars will be the greatest test of human mind, body, and spirit. The longer the mission, the harder the strain is on the human being, the greater the risk. The last time a human being went to deep space was 1972. Six people will be trapped like rats for two and a half years with no chance of escape. Imagine that you are trapped with those people in one of the small offices where you work. Would you want to be in a room with those people for years? A thousand days of smelling each other's sweat, drinking each other's urine, with no privacy and nothing to do. How are you going to keep yourself entertained? How are you going to keep yourself focused? The most challenging part of the mission will be to prevent the crew from killing themselves or each other. If anything goes wrong, there'll be no rescue mission. The astronauts are alone, and they know it. The fear of death will be constant for 1,000 days. The astronauts are under no illusion. They're in a risky business. Mental breakdown, sexual tension, near suicide, mutiny. These are not what ifs. It's all really happened on missions in space. Psychologists around the globe agree. The first crucial step to a successful mission to Mars is to select a new kind of astronaut. If we make a mistake in crew selection, then conflicts might arise on board. These conflicts can kill the crew, just like a disease. Our exploration of other worlds begins inside the human mind, seeking ways to identify and control the torment of isolation, deprivation, and loneliness. Work has already begun to solve the Achilles heel for the Mars mission. The Human Factor. from ABC News. The Apollo 13 spacecraft has had a serious power supply malfunction that could cause the lunar landing mission to be terminated early. April 1970. All right, Houston, we've had a problem. Two days after launch, Apollo 13 is crippled by an explosion. We had a pretty large bank associated with the uh, caution and warning there. Oxygen and heating systems are knocked out. Negative flight. I believe the crew reported it. An engineering team in mission control remains in constant contact with the astronauts, overcoming problem after problem to bring three men home alive. Let me look at the system by the side of the bank. The odds against success cannot be calculated. Let's solve the problem, but let's not make it any worse by guessing. Okay, well, let's make sure we don't blow the whole mission. Six days after launch, Human ingenuity triumphs over the menace of space. And welcome home. Thank you. Odyssey Houston, we show you on the main. It really looks great. This heroic, famous story will not be repeated on the Mars mission. The time delay with mission control is up to 23 minutes. Given the distance traveled through space, there will be no real-time feedback from mission control. The crew will have to sort out problems on their own. You're going away from the Earth with no chances of coming back until the two planets align back. They're not on the same orbit. The consideration of being very isolated, um, going to a world where no one has gone before but with no possibility to turn back physically until a precise time uh, is going to be completely new. Plus the trip to Mars is going to be a little boring. So what do you have? You have people floating through an endless velvety black void with nothing in sight. The journey to and from the surface of the red planet back to Earth will be a year of boredom. It's a power supply from the MTLs. This can't be good. Then there's the constant pressure that something could go wrong. Jerry Lineger, an American astronaut, 
who spent 132 days in space, was aboard the Russian station Mir for the worst fire in the history of manned orbit. A ruptured oxygen device set panels and instruments alight, and toxic smoke filled the station. There was no window to open, no fire escape. For 90 seconds, the crew fought the blaze, knowing failure meant certain death. The master alarm went off course, the smoke uh, filled the station, and it, it was uh, readily apparent that there was indeed a fire. Being a physician, I was very concerned with uh, crew health. We set up the blaze subsided, but it was a close call. Place. From my assessment, I don't see where anyone had any serious inhalation damage. It's a dire omen for those daring enough to attempt the voyage to Mars. If you will, death is a part of the business. It's an occupational hazard. So what kind of astronaut should be selected for the mission to Mars? In the beginning of the space age, NASA decided to pick astronauts from the ranks of military test pilots. In the 1960s, test pilots were dying at the rate of one a week. They had gotten used to the idea of death on the job. Call it bravery, call it an addiction to danger, these young men were exactly what NASA needed. Eight, seven, we have a go for many Four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff. All that changed with the shuttle program. Military daredevils still commanded, but scientists and school teachers now orbited the Earth. Since 1980, the qualifications at NASA were about physical fitness and specific mission skills. An expedition to Mars is a whole other ballgame. I would say that traditional, you know, uh, lone pilot facing the odds is just not going to do really well on a mission to Mars. Pat Santee worked as a psychiatrist and flight surgeon for NASA in the 1980s. The same way that engineers pay attention to even the smallest screw in a spacecraft structure, we need to pay attention to how human personality is organized, how the human psyche is structured, and how that psyche is going to interact with other human psyches. Canadian Dave Williams is a NASA astronaut. He's helping the agency find the Mars generation of space traveler. It's very interesting that when you look at astronauts and cosmonauts worldwide, these are individuals who love flying. They love mechanical devices. They love working on computers, working on their cars. They're really into the new technology. Well, right now, we're looking for the next generation of astronauts. We're calling these people exploration astronauts. And I think these folks are going to have to have a number of what we call generic skills. The capability of repairing a rover, for instance, repairing a spacesuit, maintaining a spacesuit, troubleshooting or rebuilding a computer. You do need a Mr. Fix-It man. You need the right tools. You need human ingenuity. You know, you better take some duct tape along with you, you, you know, because you cannot call back and say, hey, I need a part. These are the first humans to embark on the most incredible and dangerous voyage into the darkest reaches of space. These two young Russian men could be our first ambassadors to Mars. In any case, this will rank with the first flight to space and the flight to the moon. Well, it does not matter which country is the first one. The most important thing is that humanity broke through and made such a big step, that we prove that we're capable of flying not just around Earth, but also travel in space, a long way from the 